Well, now I know um, that not only is uh, Thomas Goldstein one of the most amazing Supreme Court advocates that there is, he's been involved in 10% uh, of all of the court's merits cases for the past 15 years. He's argued 38 cases himself. And I don't want to take a lot of more time talking about him because I want him to talk to us. I will just say that we know you are worthy because you clerked for Pat Wall. Ladies and gentlemen, Tom. Thank you so much. I'm and the first thing I want to say is I want to thank Roberta for her leadership. I mean, I have not seen, as a member, this organization with as much energy, uh, active engagement with our legislatures. Um, pretty uh, experience. I just feel personally very, very lucky uh, to have you been in for us. So I'm very, very lucky. Um, in terms of my you. Like I said, I'm very grateful. I feel wildly out of place uh, in the sense that I'm not really uh, worthy of the honor. Uh, I have spent my entire career kind of watching the Supreme Court uh, from the first day, and now it's getting to the point where it's, you know, when we practice for a while, it's half my life. Uh, and I get to practice with you know, lawyers who are unbelievably talented. It's just that they uh, also tend to be more creative and go and do other things as well. I'm totally myopic. Uh, and so I, you know, I love the court, I love the institution, I love the opportunity to get to talk about it. And we do have what is for my wife and I, our third child, SCOTUS blog, uh, that you know, has frequently been run from our kitchen table for the, you know, again, the last 15 years. Uh, and you've been, you know, Roberta and other people in this room and other other contexts have been unbelievably generous about the law, uh, which we really just regard as a, an opportunity to get out there what there should be, which is a kind of objective, neutral take on what's going on in the Supreme Court in an era in which so much is politicized and so much is spin. Uh, what I thought I would talk to you all about is the transition that we're in, as I see it, when it comes to the passing of the great Justice Scalia and be sure to be great in case he asks uh, Justice Gorsuch. Um, if, if he could only be greater, he would be. Um, and you know what what this means, I think, for the for doctrine, for the trajectory of the court, uh, and what could have been. Uh, and so the, the place that I would start is that the Supreme Court, if we were to go back to January of 2016, um, the court was kind of an ideological fracture, uh, a fissure, a fault line, with an actuarial bubble sitting on top of it that could explode. Uh, and what I mean by that is that we, of course, have a court that's closely divided. Uh, I'll talk about particular areas of law and direction of different doctrines, uh, just to illustrate a few points. But because it's so closely divided, you know, each person makes a huge difference. You have five to four, and then we had four justices who were in their late 70s uh, and early 80s. And so the, there was the real potential for the court to take in on any direction. So you could look at you know, uh, two different bodies of law, for example, to tell that as conservative as the Supreme Court is, and it's the most conservative that we've ever had, I think, objectively, the project of advancing the law in that direction was far from complete. Um, so we can look at that in two ways. One is uh, doctrine and just hadn't been filled out. And the second is stuff that Justice Kennedy was getting in the way of. Um, and that, you know, so that the, it either reached as far as it was going to go or it was still on the way. And the first example, you know, would be um, we have had a case that has come, an issue that has come to the court for several times in the past few years involving union fees. Uh, and so the question is can the in public sector union? Can non-members be required to pay what are called agency fees, so that they are financing the negotiations uh, on behalf of the union with the government, or is that an infringement on the right of association the same way it is uh, the Supreme Court has held when you require them to make uh, contributions for you know, just union, general union activities? 
And so what had come to the Supreme Court over a series of cases was a change in the direction of the law from the kind of Bay Burner Court and the Warren Court era. And the court had poised itself to hold that the leading precedent in Syria, a case called Abood, was wrongly decided and that there was a uh, associational right not to have to make these contributions. And so that's what was going on there in a variety of other areas. The law was still advancing. You can th think of it in uh, areas like the Establishment Clause, where the, you know, the wall separating church and state was coming down in a variety of cases. You can think about doctrines that were just being given birth, the Second Amendment. Before the Costello decision, the Second Amendment was regarded as something of a typo in the Constitution. It, you know, it was kind of there. It didn't really amount to much of anything. It wasn't taken seriously. Now, maybe think what you will, whether it should be or shouldn't be. It, it just wasn't. Uh, and that project had just started. The court had recognized the existence of right and had not filled out what that right was at all. So that and a bunch of other stuff, property rights, a bunch of other things, were still in progress in the beginning of 2016. And then, as I said, there was the stuff that Justice Kennedy had kind of gotten in the way of. Uh, so you could think about things like the exclusionary. So when I went to law school, it was I thought it was written into the Fourth Amendment that if the evidence was unconstitutionally succeed, uh, seized, then it would be excluded. Turns out not so. The court had come up with this exclusionary rule, and the court's most conservative members had been willing to say that they would overrule it entirely and leave uh, folks who had their Fourth Amendment rights violated to civil remedies instead. Um, but And Justice Kennedy said, no, I'm not going to overrule it. I'm just going to go this far and go further. And that's you know his approach. He's been at the center of the court. You can think about abortion. So we have the Texas abortion cases this term. And just the future of Roe versus Wade, the court has been narrowing it. But it could go substantially narrower still. Race, Justice Kennedy, for the first time this term, voted to uphold a race-conscious program affirmative action program that was before the court. And so that doctrine could go even further if the court could get another conservative member. So the first batch of cases were just, they needed more cases, and the second batch was they needed um, uh, another conservative member that would push just Kennedy out of the center seat. Um, and of course you could imagine everything in reverse, because the court has done a number of very conservative things. If the court were to switch in the opposite direction, the results are that is a bunch of things, Citizens United on down, would, I think, have been interred into nothingness or overruled outright. You know, the decisions on, for example, Section uh, 5 of the Voting Rights Act. All of that sort of thing that were quite controversial and quite recent, so they didn't have a huge stare decisis effect, were, I think, back in play, because they all hung by a single thread of a fifth vote. And that's where we stood at January 2016 in terms of doctrine that it could, the court could become substantially more conservative. And then when you think about it, that's the, the fissure that I was talking about, and then the actuarial bubble. And that is when you had two conservative justices, and Justice Scalia and Justice Kennedy, who were the, among the more wise and mature, uh, and then also in their 70s and 80s. Uh, and then we had on the left, we had Justice Breyer and Justice Ginsburg. Similarly, all of them genuinely at the top of the group. There was absolutely, everyone objectively would say that. Uh, all in apparent good health, but there is an inevitability to these things. Uh, and so there was the realistic prospect, I, I'm told, I'm, ho <laughs> I'm, ho I'm hoping inaccurately, um, but there, because of this prospect, the court was poised to go in either of two directions. And that is, if a Democrat, not, not there, it is well settled now among the justices that if they are given the opportunity to choose, they will retire under a president of similar ideology. So, you know, you're just not going to have the situation that you had with Thurgood Marshall and Justice Brennan, although they had, you know, health issues. Uh, if at all possible, not, no member of the court is going to allow the court to change in the opposite direction. And so, of course, under a Democratic president, there would have been the prospect of an involuntary retirement of Justice Kennedy, and we saw this, what happened with Justice Scalia, and the reverse is true as well. And so you now have a Republican president, obviously, you have a Republican Senate, and the real question is, you know, Justice, I, I think they would say, objectively, Justice Ginsburg and Justice Breyer right now would have every intention to pass on the bench. Uh, they're not going anywhere. But if that were to happen, not to be you know, morbid about it, but this is the reality of the situation. If that were to happen, then the court could pivot significantly. And that's what happened, obviously, in February of 2016 with the tragic passing, the completely unexpected passing of Justice Scalia. Because there we had it set up. We had a Democratic president 
who could appoint a nominee and move the court a step to the left and unwind, you know, 20 odd years of doctrine. And because it was so obvious that Hillary Clinton was obviously going to win, uh, there was the prospect that that would, you know, continue on. Because if a Democratic president gets to replace the more liberal justices, well, then you just reset 25 years. You put somebody on the court. You know, we now have tended to put people on the court when they're about 18. But if you were to just, you know, move to a reasonable 46 years old, um, <laughs> they're really at your prime. Um, then you do have the opportunity, you know, to put people on the court for quite a long time. And, of course, we have life tenure in the federal judiciary. That happened in no small part because when the country was founded, the life expectancy was 39 years old. Nobody expected that people would be on the court till basically 112. Um, so the, you know, there was the, there's the, uh, the opportunity to lock in your four votes and the opportunity to move the court in, in one direction. And so the president, who actually very kindly wrote for the blog about uh, his decision, made what I think was a catastrophic one. It's just true. Uh, of enormous historical importance, that his greatest legacy, of no matter what one thinks of President Obama, would have been the turn in the Supreme Court, and I think President Trump's uh, greatest positive legacy uh, will be what happens with respect to the Supreme Court as well. And so the president's judgment here was as follows, that he knows that the, we're, the presidential election is obviously coming up, he knows the Senate is obviously in Republican hands, and so what he decides to do is pick a Supreme Court justice from central casting, uh, and someone who Republicans have asked for, and the calculus is, well, this is going to be easy. This is obvious that Merrick Garland will be on the Supreme Court because he is dead down the center, uh, you know, deeply respected, as are so many judges, but deeply respected on the left and right, and was, you know, the, the most conservative justice that you could reasonably expect to get from a Democratic president, absent a situation where the Senate is like 70-30 or something like that. And so he picked Merrick Garland because his perspective as the president was quite different than from his perspective when he was a senator. As a senator, Barack Obama had filibustered Justice Alito, for example. Uh, he had taken quite a you know, progressive, liberal view of the Senate's role. But the president, as a former you know, law professor, uh, and as a lawyer, had taken the view that what he really wanted was people much more down the center. He wanted to bring the Supreme Court to the center, not try and engage in ideological wars. And you can see that in Elena Kagan. Elena Kagan is no firebrand liberal. I, you know, not nobody would say that. And now Sonia Sotomayor is a somewhat special case because it was a situation where you appointed the first Latino to the Supreme Court, uh, and so I do. You know, she's the court's most liberal member by far. But he he wanted he affirmatively to bring the court to the middle with an appointment that was obviously going to be confirmed. That was a catastrophic error, and obviously, if anybody had really thought about the stakes of it, completely untrue. Because conservative, judicial conservatives understand the stakes and are invested in the stakes. And judicial conservatives are still pushing back and running against the Warren Court of the late murder court. They are still fantastically upset about what they view as the hijacking of the Constitution of the United States and it being taken in a terribly wrong direction. And it is so much easier when you're trying to build a movement and you're trying to accomplish things to be against something, uh, to be perfectly honest. And they have rallied around the cry of the Supreme Court being wildly out of control. You know, you get kind of crazy views of these things. You know, Justice Chief Justice John Roberts, as you know, a solid conservative vote in the Supreme Court, is demonized as wildly too liberal because of the vote in the Affordable Care Act. I mean, just anything that or that kind of wing of the Republican Party and conservatives are fully committed to this project, completely invested. There is no other priority. And then you get things like people who are pro-life, for whom this is an absolute life and death question and a passion project. And when you have the loss of Justice Scalia, they know the stakes. And so what happened is that Republicans decided to lay down on the tracks and just say no. Now, this was wildly unprecedented. The idea that there was some notion that you wouldn't, as a president in the fourth year, that there was a hidden clause in the Constitution that says, you know, the president shall nominate with the advice and consent of the Senate in the first three years of his term or her term. You know, 13 different presidents had appointed 19 different justices, starting with George Washington, uh, in the last year of last year of their term. There was no precedent for this whatsoever. Now, Joe Biden, 
as he is often wont to do, had spouted off one day and said, you know, when the Democrats controlled the Senate, you know, I really think that this Republican president probably ought not appoint somebody. And they were, and so there were things that you could point to rhetorically. But what had happened is the combination of the following, and that is the Republicans had decided we're going to lay down the law, and the president had nominated, you know, the 53-year-old white guy, um, you know, 63-year-old white guy who is a dead centrist. You know how many people get excited about that? <laughs> right? You know, people are going to jump up and be like, I'm headed to the polls for Merrick Garland. Um, Merrick Garland doesn't want to be that person. He is, his entire career is just being very, very solidly in the center. So if the president had appointed, you know, a young African-American woman, a progressive, someone who had, um, you know, life experience outside the Department of Justice and the judiciary, something that Hillary Clinton could have pointed to, well, then we would have had a fight on your, uh, our hands. But what happened instead is the Republicans said, we are not going to hold a hearing, we don't care about this nomination, and the country went, okay, uh, whatever. Um, and what in particular happened was the fact that everybody knew that Hillary Clinton was going to win. Because what you got was the progressive groups wanted Merrick Garland not to be confirmed and wanted him not to get a hearing, in truth, at, at, at true bottom. What they believed is that when Hillary Clinton inevitably won the presidency, they could persuade her not to follow through with the Garland appointment and appoint somebody younger uh, and more liberal. And so nobody got behind them. Nobody put political pressure on. And then there was this election going on that got a little crazy. And so everybody got distracted. And so he sat in a, a travesty, you know, just objectively, whatever you think ideologically or anything, just in terms of how the process ought to function. Um, and so you were left, of course, with the seat being open. Uh, Hillary Clinton manages to lose this election. And then we get uh, an appointment of Neil Gorsuch, who is going to be, I think, very solidly in the legacy of Justice Scalia. Um, you are taught, you are, Justices change while they're on the court. They get exposed to things. They make choices that they didn't have to make before because obviously they're making more precedent where before they were following more precedent. But what I think Neil Gorsuch has been entirely straightforward in his views about things. He was before he was nominated and in his confirmation hearings. So all you had to do was listen. He is more committed to the project of originalism than any other member of the Supreme Court save Justice Thomas, I think. I mean, he is very, very serious. And it, you, there was no need uh, to be as clear about this if it weren't the case. If you were to go back and look at the confirmation hearings of the Chief Justice, of Justice Alito, of Elena Kagan, so folks on the left and right, they uniformly give the answer, there's no one interpretive methodology. You know, it just depends on the case. We have different tools that we look at, the original understanding, the, you know, the, the plain text, what it's intended to accomplish, all those sorts of things. You give a classic non-answer that will satisfy everybody. Neil Gorsuch said, I'm trying to figure out the original purpose, uh, excuse me, the original meaning of the Constitution in a very much like Justice Scalia's original public meaning way of looking at the Constitution, except Justice Scalia blew a little bit hot and cold about it, to be perfectly honest. The person who has been just down the line about it has been Justice Thomas because he just doesn't care about precedent. I mean, if, if something is wrong, it's wrong, and he thinks that it should be overruled. He has no view uh, of any real significance that, we sh that the court should be following stare decisis. And when it comes to text, I think that what you've seen is Justice Gorsuch saying, I'm a textualist, just like Justice Scalia, that he cares very much about this. Uh, and what you really come to realize is that with Justice Scalia's passing, we lost an incredible voice on the court. But he won the war. The way that we look at the Constitution and the stat and statutes right now is radically different. If you look at Supreme Court opinions now and 25 years ago, they bear almost no resemblance to each other when it comes to interpretive questions. He single-handedly brought the law around, brought, brought the lawyers in this room around, brought the judiciary around to the notion of paying much more attention to the text and when it comes to the Constitution, its original meaning. And what you are actually going to get, I think, is a, a Supreme Court that is a little bit more conservative than when Justice Scalia was on it because he had his quirks. Justice Scalia in his later years would say he was criminal defendant's best friend on the Supreme Court. Because he would go where his principles took him. Particularly, he had the view that the rule of lenity meant something in the criminal law, that there were you know, these very vague criminal statutes and folks weren't on notice of what could be a crime. And he, you know, Merrick Garland wouldn't have gone along with that, and I doubt that Justice Gorsuch will be as, as strong in that view. And Justice Scalia was kind of 
at the you know, responsible practically for the birth, along with Justice Stevens, in the Renaissance of the Confrontation Clause, uh, in sentencing, for example, and all of those tended to lean left in the favor of criminal defendants in particular. And if you take a kind of more purely doctrinaire conservative like a Justice Alito, you just don't see a lot of sympathy for that. Um, there were the, One way of looking at what happened in the Supreme Court with Justice Scalia is that the two wings of the Supreme Court, with Scalia and Thomas and the more liberal justices, came around together against the center of the court. You would have Justice Breyer and the Chief Justice and Justice Kennedy in dissent against the two wings of the court. And I think now the center of the court is going to take uh, greater control. Uh, so what happens in the more medium term? Well, you, and what does it mean uh, with the prospect that Democrats conceivably could retake the Senate? Well, if that were to happen, I think that the calculus changes, but not a ton, because the president is committed to judicial conservatives on this question. And you see it in the list that was generated, along with a significant input, if not writing, by the Federal Society, by Heritage. What he quite sensibly realized is that he could do this, and that is identify conservative nominees, and by nominating them and showing that he would go in that direction, he would get the unflinch, essentially unflinching loyalty of a significant part of the Republican Party that was committed to that as their first priority. And so the president isn't going anywhere on this question. And Democrats, just as in the Merrick Garland instance, are just not lay down on the tracks people about this. They have other things that they are trying to accomplish. So I would say that you would expect that um, it's quite likely that uh, Justice Kennedy, one would say that President Trump's, you know, uh, re-election is less than certain right now. Um, you know, it's at least a toss-up. Um, the, and so I would think that in, there's a very real prospect that Justice Kennedy will retire, a very real prospect that Clarence Thomas will retire. I don't think he's ever viewed this as kind of his you know, lifelong project. And then, so immediately what you get is that second batch of cases where Justice Kennedy's in the way. And so you have a Republican president uh, con, you know, replacing a conservative nominee but the law in that respect will move materially to the right because of issues like abortion and race and the things that Justice Kennedy has been holding the line on. I think uh, same-sex marriage, by the way, is not going anywhere. I think the country has just moved, and the, the Chief Justice in particular I don't think has any interest in, in overturning that decision. But there are other things that uh, Justice Kennedy has refused to do that I think are very much uh, part of the project. And then if Justice uh, Breyer or Justice Ginsburg were to leave the court, then what you're talking about is a generational catastrophe for the left. And that is, I do think that the upshot of what happened with Merrick Garland and of the, with the election is that the law, the Constitution means something radically different now and will mean something radically different than it would have if that nomination had gone differently. I mean, the court is divided five to four, and it would have pivoted back decently hard in the direction of the Warren Court era. And because it didn't do that, it is instead going to continue its trajectory to the right. And it is astonishing to think, you know, we have one document, we have a constitution, we have a shared set of understandings. How much turned on the decision to nominate Merrick Garland, the, you know, the quite correct strategic calculus by Mitch McConnell to lay down on the tracks and say we're not going to hold hearings or confirm anybody. Uh, and I think that uh, what we should all expect is much, significantly more of the same in the direction of the court. And you can think that's a great thing or uh, a, a terrible thing. But I do think that we will look back in 25 years and think of this as a, you know, a catastrophic mistake by a Democratic president and by progressives uh, that has charted the course of the right to choose and affirmative action, uh, gun rights, things that people care tremendously about and have effects uh, every single day. So, you know, it's, it was a very interesting thing, obviously, to be able to get to go through uh, with the blog. It's fascinating to be uh, uh, litigating in the court in these times. I do want to say that I think that as a litigator, that what the court's doing is perfect. Um, that they're, you know, the wisdom that is coming to the court is exceptional. Uh, the writing is even better. They work harder every day, I think. Um, uh, you know, they need to do a little bit better in granting cases. I have a few suggestions. The, um, but, but I mean, I, we should all, no matter what you think of things ideologically, we should be proud of the institution. It's the only thing in this town that works. Uh, it, it, the Chief Justice, it, it really, have you written the Metro? The, um, the, the, um, 
you know, the Chief Justice cares enormously about that. The justices do. It is a very well-functioning or institution, and we're lucky to have it. Uh, so let me uh, stop there. Uh, what I want to do... Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I did want to take... Uh, I want to keep everybody on schedule so that we can get to our next session, uh, which is at quarter of, but did want to take the opportunity to, if, if folks had any questions about what I talked about or anything else related to the Supreme Court, um, you please. Yes, sir. And I'll, I'll, I can repeat the question if you want. But let me ask you this. Um, suppose Justice Gorsuch would discover the original meaning of the 11th Amendment. Um, he might even discover the Constitution only allocates to Congress the power to declare war. And who knows, he might ultimately even come around and read the Ninth Amendment. Maybe there's hope. <laughs> Look, originalism is a, you know, an extremely complicated topic, obviously. Uh, and where, how far Justice Gorsuch is willing to go, Justice Thomas, for example, is willing to think about all that stuff. In fact, nothing would make him happier to think about every one of those things and have the opportunity to write about all of them. And it will be, and Justice Scalia was less interested in kind of novel re-understandings of established doctrine. Privileges and immunities, all kinds of stuff. The Ninth Amendment, for sure. Uh, a lot of libertarian takes on the Constitution. Uh, and it will be fascinating to see where Justice Gorsuch will go. And just realize that this is a, itself a half-century project. You know, Justice Scalia moved the law over a significant amount of time. This is all rooted, actually, in a set of dissents by William Rehnquist when he was an associate justice. A, a ton of American laws, is, you can go find it in dissents by solo dissents by him. And the things that Justice Thomas is doing now that maybe Justice Gorsuch will join him are, it's fascinating to see if these are just seeds that are being planted that will be picked up. Because, you know, our approach to the law is malleable. It's very different now than when, you know, just when I was in law school. And it has the prospect of being very different again. And what's conservative and what's liberal? You know, every member of the Supreme Court is, is arguably more conservative than every member of the more the most li liberal version of the Warren Court. So, you know, where you draw the line in these things is, is wildly different. So it is fascinating. Get a second justice who yeah. shares that view. Yeah, privileges and immunities uh, versus the Commerce Clause is a, another very significant issue. So, oh, and I think she's going to give you. Where do you see church-state separation going? Um, I think the playground case looks like it's been decided, but but more generally and over a longer period of time, because that's a very tough area of law. Yeah. So this was something that the court really struggled with with Justice uh, O'Connor. Or, you know, we have a couple of cases about Ten Commandments monuments that are, in, you know, you cannot, uh, as brilliant as the justices are, Homer nods, I have no clue what they were saying. Um, you know, the, the cases seem to point in exactly the opposite direction. They were decided the same day. The, um, this is, a, I think, a very significant part of the project. Uh, and I do think that you will see a number of very important decisions. The playing background cases, I think, kind of easy. The left, uh, on some religion issues, has come along. Uh, and I, I would think that, that that case may well be unanimously decided or something like 72 or, or 71. Um, the, I would think that, I think it's quite likely that you will see a much more enthusiastic reception from the court on things like vouchers, on things like monuments, on things like prayer. Do I think that they'll you know, go all the way to school prayer in public schools? Not this majority. But I, I do think that laws that relates to religion is on the fast track, and is something actually you just didn't see in the first 10 years of John Roberts. It wasn't where the court was focused. It was focused on other things, and I think religion is in the top three of what's next. Uh, as somebody who uh, exercises First Amendment rights, what do you see as the prognosis in terms of both comments and the effort to deal with the Um, You know, I, I think that where speech goes, where you know, things as, as interesting and, and uncharted as treason go, is really, really, really a 
and serve. You know, there's a lot of American law that the justices just haven't had the opportunity to think about or any reason to think about. I mean, I think the travel ban is a really interesting example of what's going to come to the court. I think actually the second travel ban is quite likely to survive the Supreme Court. I think that, you know, what happens is you get these constitutional moments. The Supreme Court, when it came to the Gitmo cases, for example, just went to, at loggerheads with President Bush on President Bush saying the court should get out. The Supreme Court said, actually, you know, uh, and and said that there were rights of judicial review and the Constitution would apply. Um, and so it is very interesting to me what the court will do with this constitutional moment, what they will think of this president. Uh, I think lower court judges have been deeply disturbed by some of the president's comments uh, about judges and also about the substance of things like the travel ban. And I think the Supreme Court justices are kind of more inured to that. So I don't think the politics of the moment will matter nearly as much to them as it has mattered in the litigation that's happened so far. Um, but that the travel ban is coming, for sure. Um, when it, the, the, the free speech doctrine that I would watch the most is probably commercial speech. That was one that was kind of on a real pivot and is part of a constitutional deregulatory agenda, and that is that a lot of regulation, because it prevents communication that is thought to be deceptive, is a violation of the First Amendment. And that doctrine was pushing in the, the direction of saying that a lot of that regulation, like off-branded sales of drugs, is unconstitutional. Sir? Um, if you were to say uncharted, you would say guns, because we have no, you know, the gun, who knows what the, the firearm right is. And I don't think the court really knows. I think it's struggling internally, which is why it hasn't taken any cases, and property rights. Uh, in the wake of Kilo, uh, and whether the court will take that sort of thing more seriously. And then, of course, there's the high-stakes stuff, uh, including particularly abortion, which is where I think you know, the court will invest a significant amount of capital, but do it as quietly as possible. You know, this is the difference. Justice Scalia accused the Chief Justice of faux judicial modesty, because Justice Scalia wanted to put the pedal down. Little did he know that you know there was the real prospect that he was right. Justice Scalia wanted to get to the end in these cases very, very quickly because he knew that you know the the how long this majority would last it was fraught and uncertain. And the Chief Justice has been much more measured. He has preserved the court's political capital. So I wouldn't expect to see anything radical on anything. That's why we're at this situation with the union fees case. That's why Citizens United is like the fourth in a line of cases. This kind of judicial incrementalism is, I think, what you'll see, but it, it has very significant uh, consequences. Good afternoon. Uh, good to see you again. The North Carolina case, uh, uh, Judge Mott's opinion in the Fourth Circuit, which actually took pretty big chunks out of the North Carolina State Legislature, survived because the court didn't grant certiorari. Many thought it would be granted. I'm wondering if uh, you have any thoughts on that vote count or that issue or what we're going to see with voting rights with respect to this court as it's currently proposed. Sure. Well, voting rights is fascinating right now. We, of course, just had the racial gerrymandering case where Justice Thomas provides the, the decisive vote in favor of invalidating the districts. The case that we're talking about right now is the, the voter ID case. And what happened there is I think that the you know conservatives, they've had a case like this before. I think they are relatively comfortable with these statutes. It's just that North Carolina politics got turned upside down, and nobody knew who was supposed to be pursuing the case in that court. And the Chief Justice actually wrote about this to say, this is just a train wreck in front of me. Um, you do not take anything from the fact that we are not taking this case. Uh, and so I think you'll have voter ID back up there uh, relatively soon, and I think that the conservatives will take a, a quite favorable view of it. It'll depend on the precise statute, of course, but um, they may not think it's wise, and I think the justices are probably extremely doubtful that there's the, this significant problem with voter fraud, but I think that they're going to find it hard to find in the Constitution something that says you can't require somebody to have ID. Now, if it's an ID that's super hard to get and there's a record about that, that'll be a different thing. Uh, maybe just uh, one more, and then we'll get you on to the next uh, session. Ma'am. Had there been a different nomination, rather, the left would have mobilized. But in the final analysis, would that have made a particle of difference? It yeah, would have been it's a mobilization, yeah. but you'd be where you are now. Right. It, it, it's a question that you can't know. It depends on how they mobilize, who does it, on what front. There are two possible implications of nominating somebody, you know, a young African-American woman uh, who's a progressive. 
there are both the implications in the Senate vote and the prospect that Republicans will be concerned that they are perceived as both sexist and racist because, you know, you are standing in the way of somebody extremely qualified. And then the electoral implications. You know, the, the conservatives were mobilized about the Supreme Court. More progressive voters needed something tangible. They needed to be able to wrap their arms around it because they're decently satisfied with the Supreme Court. Conservatives are still running against, you know, the, the Warren Court. Um, the court has gotten much more conservative about this, but progressives haven't managed to get upset about this. They care more about legislative things like the Affordable Care Act. And so if they could have gotten somebody in there that Hillary Clinton would have wrapped her arms around and mobilized a set of voters, uh, you know, it, it could well have been different. I'm not sure that, you know, we're talking about a very specific set of voters in the end and a very specific set of states. It would have been quite different than it played out. Whether it would have been decisive, I think, is a, is a much harder question. It's like Bush versus Gore. Um, so, uh, thank you so much. I think that we're going to have uh,